You're listening to TIP. On today's show, we bring you a longtime friend and guest of the show, Dr. James Rickards. Dr. Rickards is the New York Times bestselling author three times over for his books, Currency Wars, The Death of Money, and The Road to Ruin. He's an op-ed contributor for the New York Times, Washington Post, and he's a regular contributor on CNBC, Bloomberg, and The Wall Street Journal. Dr. Rickards is an alumni of Johns Hopkins University, UPenn, and NYU. On today's show, we'll be talking to Dr. Rickards about current central banking decisions around the world and the potential impact on the bond and stock markets. So without further delay, let's get started. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, this is the Investor's Podcast, and I'm your host, Preston Pish. And as always, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson. Like we said in the introduction, we're joined with our good friend, Jim Rickards. Jim, welcome back to the show. We're always so thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Preston. Thank you, Stig. It's great to be with you. So, Jim, I want to hop into the thing that I personally enjoy talking to you the most about, and that's just central banking in general. Because each time you come on the show, you just always have such a wealth of information to kind of give people a little bit of foresight as to what they can expect in the coming quarter and the in the coming six months. So what I would ask you is, what are you hearing? What's the story you're hearing today with respect, specifically with respect to quantitative tightening, with respect to the federal funds rate, things like that? What's the word on the street? It's topic number one, uh, whether you, you like the Fed or uh, don't like the Fed, the fact is they, they sort of run the world. It's, you know, people know the basic statistics on the dollar. It's about round numbers. It's about 60% of global reserves. It's about 80% of global payments. It's about 100% of the oil market, not quite, but close to 100%. So you just look at those numbers and you go, wow, the dollar dominates. It's, it gives the U.S. A, a huge political weapon, a huge, actually, a military weapon, because a lot of the payment system has been weaponized. This is how we impose sanctions. Sanctions. You know, you hear about sanctions all the time. Well, how do we actually do sanctions? Well, one of the ways we do it is we kick you out of the payment system. We freeze your accounts, seize your assets. We do secondary boycotts. So if you're a, a Swiss bank or a French bank and you do business with someone who's the target of our sanctions, could be, you know, Russia, North Korea, Venezuela, a lot of other countries, we'll kick you out of the payment system. So if you're a UBS or a Credit Suisse or a Deutsche Bank, you don't dare go near any of our adversaries who are being sanctioned, even if you're not doing sanctions yourself, because you'll end up on the wrong side of that. So it's a very powerful weapon. But even that, even what I just described does not capture the full extent of dollar power because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. And actually, the Bank of England just had a new report on this. This gets into the world of currency swaps. And a currency swap is is simple, but unbelievably important. It gives the U.S. even more leverage than most people realize. For example, just go back to the 2008 financial crisis. What was at the heart of the crisis? I mean, it started with mortgages, but that wasn't really why it got so bad. It, It was the contagion effect. It spread to government securities, junk bonds, corporate stock, international payment. It just spread in in every direction. But one of the biggest problems was the European banks made more money lending dollars than they did lending, you know, euro or Swiss francs or any other currency. Well, if if you're a European bank and you're going to lend dollars, you have to finance the dollars. You need dollar liabilities to go along with those dollar assets. And one of the things they did was issue commercial paper. They had deposits, uh, but they issued commercial paper. And there was huge appetite that in the U.S. money market funds, which bought U.S. dollar denominated commercial paper from European banks. Well, when Lehman Brothers failed, a couple of uh, money market funds failed right around the same time. All the money market fund operators refused to roll over that European bank, commercial paper that said, hey, Deutsche Bank, we're not going to take any more of your paper or unit credit or UBS or, or any of the others. So when any commercial bank is in that situation, they turn to their central bank. The central bank is the lender of last resort. But the problem was the ECB doesn't print dollars. They print euros. These banks needed dollars. The Fed prints dollars, but they weren't the principal regulators. So what did they do? The Fed printed up $5 trillion and the ECB printed up 5 trillion euros or equivalent, and they swapped. So the euros, all of a sudden the Fed has all these euros, the ECB got the dollars. At that point, the ECB was able to lend dollars to the European banks to bail out the European banking system. So not only did the Fed bail out Wall Street, 
and indirectly bail out General Motors and Chrysler and a lot of uh, General Electric and uh, the entire stock market and all the U.S. institutions. They bailed out the European banking system through these swaps. Since then, these swap arrangements have proliferated. The U.S. has about 20 or so partners among major central banks, including obviously ECB, Bank of Japan, but many others, the Central Bank of South Korea, and kind of our allies and friends throughout the world. And China has put some of them in place. China has a swap arrangement with uh, Switzerland uh, regarding uh, Swiss francs and Chinese yuan. But the point is, these foreign central banks are even more dependent on the Fed than people realize because of these swap arrangements, which are off the books, do not require any congressional approval, et cetera. So the dollar is, it's not king dollar anymore. It's more like an emperor. So having said that, my view has been for a long time that that system is more vulnerable than people realize that whenever you're that powerful, you're always going to cause a, a reaction. So that's the action, king dollar. But the reaction, if you're Russia, or your China, or your, for that matter, North Korea, or Iran, or Turkey, or any of these other countries, you're sitting there saying, well, okay, I get it. What can I do to work around the system? What can I do to create an alternative? Uh, how do I get out from under dollar hegemony? And they're very far down that road. Russia, China, they're building their own internet that's not connected to the, what we regard as the internet or the World Wide Web. They're stockpiling gold. We can talk some more about that. They're working on cryptocurrencies. Now, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm not saying go out and buy Bitcoin. They're working on their own. So you call it a Putin coin or a Xi coin, whatever you like. They're getting close to rolling out a system that would work a little bit as follows. So, you know, Iran could buy missile technology from North Korea. Russia could buy infrastructure from China. China could buy weapons from Russia. Iran could buy weapons from Russia. Uh, Russia's a big export of nuclear power plants. Turkey's a, a good intermediary, a big tourist destination. That's a big part of their economy. The big one would be China buying oil from Iran. So you have all these uh, bilateral trade relations going on. All of a sudden, and you don't price them in dollars because oil and some of these other things are priced in dollars. You don't price them in dollars. You price them in these new coins. They could have a stable value of, you know, one Putin coin is worth one SDR. You don't have to use the US dollars, your anchor. And then you just you just keep score. You know, so I ship stuff to you. You ship stuff back to me. One of us owes the other at the end of the day, periodically, monthly, quarterly, twice a year. You look at the scorecard and you settle up in physical gold and you can actually move the gold around. You put it on a plane and fly. That's how you move gold. There's no wire transfer transfer, nothing digital, nothing to hack. So all of a sudden you've got this whole system, you've got an alternative currency, it's backed by gold, but the gold would only have to move on a net basis. See, that's the key. It wouldn't have to move on a gross basis. On a net basis, you'd keep score with these coins. But on a net basis, you would just convert it to gold at some SDR rate and settle up. And what's important about that system is there are no dollars involved. You can't sanction it. You can't hack it. You can't shut it down. And the world moves on without the dollar. So that's is the dollar extremely powerful? Yes. Has it been weaponized to pursue foreign policy goals, military goals? Yes. But like any powerful weapon, it invites a response, and uh, that's in the process of happening. Uh, so it'll be interesting times, you know, in the years ahead to see this play out. So when I look at the actions that we've all seen from the Fed recently, so we had the big Christmas. Uh drop in the stock market there on Christmas Eve. I mean, it, it was down 20% very abruptly. And you saw, surprisingly, Powell through that drop was really not indicating that he was going to change course in, in any direction. But then right there at around Christmas time, maybe slightly after Christmas time, you had everyone in the equity market just squealing as to the pain that they were feeling. And I think a lot of people were looking back to previous cycles and saying, hey, at this point in time, the U.S. central bank was starting to ease. What is your take on some of that maneuvering? Because as soon as that happened and we saw the market, I mean, this this has to be one of the biggest bounces I think we've ever seen in the U.S. stock market with, I mean, it's probably bounced, what, 17% or something like that. The backstory is very deep. It involves a lot of wordsmithing, a lot of psychology, a lot of head fakes. But let me just give you the quick version of it. So we all know what happened in 2008, 2009. QE1. I don't think they did it the right way, but it had to be done. That is a central bank's job. You are the lender of last resort. So no one really argues with QE1. I, I personally would have been a lot tougher. I would have nationalized the banks and cleaned out the balance sheets, stripped out the assets, put them in trust for the American people, sold them off over whatever, 20 years, and then IPO the clean banks. You know, you don't want a government run banking system. But it could be privately held, but you had to clean it up. But, but QE2 and QE3 were different. And I was on CNBC in August of 2009, 2009. Literally just six months after the, the depth of the crisis, which was March, three months after the end of the recession, there was a Fed meeting coming up. And uh, I think it was Joe Kiernan asked me what they should do. I said they should raise rates. 
I've seen 2,000 eyes. It's just a little, you know, 25 basis points. You don't have to do a whole sequence just to let the world know we're going to get back to normal. They did not do that. They didn't raise rates until 2015, six years of zero interest rate policy, and then QE2 and QE3. Now, the important thing to know about that, completely unprecedented. We've never done anything like that in the history of the United States, in the history of the Federal Reserve from 1913. They had never done anything like that. This was an experiment. And I talked to Bernanke about it. And he's a great admirer of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And as a close student, he sort of made his academic reputation on studying the Great Depression in the, the footsteps of Anna Schwartz and Milton Freeman. And what he admired about Roosevelt, Roosevelt was no economist, but he was always willing to try something. He thought doing something was better than doing nothing. He was he just going to sit there and let the recession or let the Great Depression somehow unwind itself? He was going to do something. If that didn't work, he would do something else. Now, that's the opposite of the, the Hippocratic Oath in medicine. You know, it's the first do no harm. And doctors are told, don't do anything unless you know what you're doing. They can't see how it did much good. It didn't necessarily do a lot of harm, but it didn't do much good either. It's just sort of a, most of the action was not in GDP, not in rising wages, not in strong economic growth. The action was inflated asset values. The auctions say, well, the money goes somewhere. If it's not going into consumer prices and velocity, it's going into asset prices. And that's what happened in real estate and stocks. So they got that reflation, if you want to call it that. Now, they got to 2013 and they said, okay, now we have to get out of this. You know, they painted themselves in the corner and how do you get out? That was the taper talk. That was sort of a near meltdown of emerging markets, just the suggestion that they were going to do it. So September 13, September 2013, everyone's ready for the liftoff. It doesn't happen. That was you know in response to this meltdown, but it, di it did happen in, uh, later that year. So they started the taper, finished a year later in 2014. Now you're ready for a liftoff, which is the first interest rate hike. That didn't happen until December 2015, and they started a tightening cycle. But the whole time from 2009, even actually to today, till 2019, we're almost 10 years into this expansion. Average growth, annual average growth in GDP over the last 10 years has been 2.24%. 2.24%. All the recoveries since 1980, the average is 3.24. It's a full point higher. This is why I call it a depression. This is using John Maynard Keynes' definition. A depression doesn't mean you're, the GDP is always going down. That's, that's not going to happen. Depression means that you have depressed growth. Your actual growth is below potential. It's below trend. And if you think one percentage point doesn't sound like a lot, it is. It, we've left uh, in a $20 trillion economy, take a point off. For 10 years, you're talking $5 trillion, $5 trillion of wealth left on the table. Imagine someone walking into the Oval Office today, handing the president a check for $5 trillion, saying, here, Mr. President, do what you want with this for the good of the American people. That's how much wealth we've lost because of this depressed growth. And they still can't get out of it. So, so why was the Fed, even though I thought they should raise rates in 2009, why were they scared to death to raise rates in, in 2015, 2016? They wanted to. They want to raise rates. The path the Fed is on now, again, is, as I said before, it's completely unprecedented. Why would you raise rates in a weak economy? Well, normally you wouldn't, but they have to get rates high enough so that when the next recession hits, they can cut them. This is like, you know, hitting yourself on the head with a hammer because it feels good when you stop. So how much do you have to cut them to get out of a recession? Well, economic history shows long time series that it takes four to five percentage points of cuts to get the U.S. economy out of a recession. Let's just take the low end. Let's take 4%, 400 basis points. How do you cut 400 basis points when you're only at 225 basis points? Two and a quarter percent. The answer is you can't, right? You're not even close. So if we go into a recession today, and I'm not predicting it, the economy's weak, but we're going to have a recession sooner than later. If they can't get rates to four or four and a half, five percent, they're not going to be able to cut them enough to get out of a recession. So then what do you do? So let's just say it happened tomorrow and you cut them from a two and a quarter back down to zero. What do you do next if you're not, you're not out of the recession? QE4, that's exactly right. And by the way, that's the reason they're reducing the balance sheet. That's the reason they started QT, quantitative tightening. You know, during QE, there was a very famous cartoon image of it was Ben Bernanke with a manic look on his face, hanging out of a helicopter, holding the strut with one hand and throwing out $100 bills with the other hand. I'm sure you've seen it uh, on the web or whatever. Well, imagine a new cartoon. It's, it's a furnace with a stack of $100 bills and Jay Pell sitting there with a shovel throwing the money into the furnace. That's what he's doing. That's what QT is. You reduce base money. You're reducing M0. Somehow we're supposed to believe that printing money was good for the economy and inflated asset values, but burning money is not going to take the asset values down. Of course it will. So why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because they want to get the balance sheet down so they can go back up again in QE4. 
and they want to get interest rates up so they can cut them again in the next recession. So they're trying to reload the reload the gun or fill up the toolkit, as the case may be, to get ready for a recession. The conundrum is, how do you get ready for the next recession without causing the recession you're trying to cure? Now, Jim, I'm looking at this chart from Yadini Research Group. And it shows the aggregated global level of central bank's balance sheet. And that was growing, as one might expect, after QE1. And then what you see here at the end of 2017, when the Fed was starting to tighten or burning money, as you refer to it, Jim, then you saw the global balance sheets contract. But then what you recently have seen is that it's going in reverse. The U.S. is not, but we have the ECB and the Bank of Japan that is back in print mode. Do you expect this trend to persist? And why is it important for us as investors to track the progress? No, this is going to persist. And uh, the thing that's important to understand about ease is that there's a very important behavioral and psychological component to it. And, and here's what I mean by that. The Fed path starting in 2015 has been raised rates four times a year, 25 basis points each, every March, June, September, December, like clockwork until you get to this target of, say, 4%. However, they do pause. They have paused occasionally. And what are the conditions under which they pause? Because this is why, actually, forecasting central bank policy is very easy. It's just, so your baseline scenario is four times a year, like clockwork, for to at least 2021. So the trick is, well, okay, but we know they pause. Yes, they do. What are the conditions under which they pause? One is disorderly markets. When you have stock markets not only going down, but going down in a way that risks getting out of control, building on itself, going down. The Fed doesn't care if the markets go down 15% in six months, but they do care if it goes down 15% in three or four weeks. And that was the kind of drawdown we were seeing last fall, as you correctly described it up until Christmas. That's one. The other one is very powerful disinflation or even deflation. Their target is 2%. They use um, core PCE year over year. So personal consumption expenditure, core prices year over year. That's their benchmark, and they've set it at 2%. Well, if it's 1.9, they figure they're close, they worry about it. But if you see that going down, right now it is going down, 1.9, 1.8, certainly a year and a half ago was down as low as 1.5. That's enough to get them to pause. And the third element, if job creation dries up. Well, look at the scorecard. Job creation is strong, continues to be strong, despite the government shutdown, despite some natural disasters and a lot of other things. So job creation is strong, so that they're okay with that. The Price deflator has been pretty strong. It was up to 1.9. They got to like two for, they've been at two for one or two months in the last six years. So they have not been uh, sticking the landing, but it's been close enough. But the thing that spooked them three times in the last four years is a disorderly market. And we saw this in September 2015. So the Fed did not raise rates in September 2015. Why? Because the U.S. stock market declined 11% in the last three weeks of August. That was the shock Chinese devaluation, and U.S. stock markets fell completely out of bed. I don't know where people were on Labor Day weekend in 2015, but a lot of people had a sick feeling in their stomach. It looked like there was no bottom, and the Fed paused. Then the market turned around, because it was a form of ease, and then they, they finally did raise in December 2015. No sooner was that done than we had another stock market collapse from January 1st to February 10th, 2016. Stock market went down 11% again. That was also caused by Chinese devaluation. The Chinese hadn't learned their lesson. So in March, the um, the G20 finance ministers met in Shanghai. They cooked up the Shanghai Accord and the Fed did not raise rates in March of 2016. Again, that was a reaction to a, a disorderly market. So they do this occasionally. And of course, they're not going to raise rates in March. This month, March of 2019, that's pretty much baked in the pie. We'll see what happens in June. But they haven't cut rates. What does it mean to ease? What it means is your expectation is they're going to raise, but then they let you know that they're not going to raise. And relative to expectations, that's a form of ease. But look at what's going on here. It's a psychological game. They don't actually cut rates. They don't want to give any of this back because they still want to get to 4%, but they don't want to cause a recession. So they'll ease when they have to. I happen to have some uh, one-on-one conversations with the guy behind the scenes on all this. He's not a member of the Board of Governors, but he might as well be. He's been tapped three times by Bernanke, Yellen, and now Powell. Every time he tries to go back to his day job, they, the Fed calls him back. He does the wordsmithing. When I say wordsmithing, I don't mean writing the press releases. I mean, it's practically like encryption. There are code words. And everyone's picked up on uh, patient. But if you go back to March, 2000, sorry, March 2015, that was when the taper was over. 
we were getting ready for so-called liftoff, which, and then Janet Yellen gave a press conference and they issued a statement and she did not use the word patient. If you look at all the prior FOMC statements, the word patient was in there. Patient was code for, we are not raising rates till further notice and we will let you know when we will, which means risk on. You can do the carry trade. When you do a carry trade, you're shorting the dollar. You're borrowing dollars and you're investing in something else. And so that means you're short dollars. And uh, how do you lose money in that? Well, you can do a carry trade, leverage to 10 to one and make nice 20% returns on equity, but you better better have a bomb shelter when the Fed raises rates because all of your short positions are going to go underwater very quickly. Your cost of funds is going to go way up. So what the Fed says is, okay, when they use the word patient, they mean we're not raising rates until further notice. You can do the carry trades safely. You can be risk on safely. Go out and make some money and we'll signal you. How do they signal you? One of these days, they, and this is what happened in uh, March of 2015, they leave out the word patient. And then that says, okay, we're going to possibly raise rates at the next meeting, maybe the meeting after that. But if you get caught on the wrong side of a carry trade, shame on you because we told you what we're going to do. You got your warning with at least three months, maybe six months to respond. Now, I think a lot of people have picked up on this. I'm going back four years and they've been using this word patient exactly as I described it. It's code. Now, lately, everyone's picked up on it and Bloomberg and everybody is like, oh, they use the word patient. Well, yeah, they, they started doing it five years ago. It is a signaling mechanism. So if they use the word patient in March, that tells you they will not raise rates in June. If they leave the word patient out, it doesn't mean they will raise rates in June, but it means that they might. So they're saying the coast is clear. But it's all driven by the same thing, which is they have not given up on raising rates. That's, there are some people I respect, and they're like, well, the next Fed move is going to be a rate cut. We don't know when, but you know, probably by 2020. And I say, no, they're going to pause. They're not going to raise rates until further notice. But they have not given up on this bigger goal of getting rates up to 4%. They have to, because otherwise they can't fix a recession. Keeping your response in mind and knowing that the other central banks, including ECB and Bank of Japan, like we talked about, they're loosening their monetary policy. The U.S. is holding firm, perhaps even contracting a little. What is the future implication of the situation right now in regards to the U.S. dollar? What we're seeing is the continuation of the currency wars. Now, unlike the 1920s and 1930s, where it was really cutthroat, Bernanke reinvented currency wars as a game of pass the canteen. You know, so you've got you know five Marines, they're, they're assaulting a position, it's 100 degrees out, they've got no water, they've got one canteen. Each guy would like to drink the whole canteen, but they don't. You take a sip, hand it to the next guy, he takes a sip, and you pass it on. That's how Bernanke reinvented the currency wars. The U.S. is looking around the world. We're a global player, of course, and Europe looks very weak. Japan is either in a recession. Actually, Japan is in a recession. Germany is flirting with recession. Italy's in a recession. I mean, we're complaining about 2% growth versus 3% growth, and it's a big deal. But these other countries I just mentioned, including some of the major economies in the world, are looking at actual recessions. China, which is not quite in the club, but they're obviously the second largest economy in the world, so they're, they're an important player. Their growth is slowing down. Now, they have such high growth that they're not in a recession. But when you take China from 10% to 6%, that's a big deal. I mean, second largest economy in the world, about 15% of global output, and you slow them down by, by 20%, going from 10 to 8 or 8 to 6 or more, that's a big deal. That, that really haircuts global growth. So the whole world's slowing down. The U.S. is, if it's not quite the, uh, the little engine that could, it's at least the only source of growth. So what we say is, okay, guys, here's the deal. We'll have a stronger dollar. You weaken your currencies. You ease. We'll tighten or at least just stand still. And uh, you go ahead with your easing policies. You'll get a cheaper currency. That'll help your exports, create some jobs, give you a boost. Maybe it comes out of our pocket a little bit, but it's not in our interest to see all these other economies start another you know, financial panic. So, so you're exactly right. It means a stronger dollar or at least continue to strengthen the dollar. And we already see a weak euro and a, and a weak yen. The yuan's a little different because there's a political factor there. That's a, that's a weapon in the trade wars. We haven't really talked about the trade wars, but China's in a trade war with the United States. The last thing they want to do is cheapen their currencies, promote exports. That's enough to make uh, you know, Bob Lighthizer go, uh, go ballistic. So, uh, so they won't do that, at least in the short run. But in the longer run, I expect they will. So yeah, the dollar strength is going to maintain, not because we like a strong dollar, but because if we don't give those other guys a break, if we don't pass the canteen, the world's going to be in a much worse place. When we saw this dynamic play out starting in 2015, where the ECB started easing like crazy, because at this point, you could maybe argue this is where the U.S. stopped drinking from the canteen and then handed it over to the ECB. 
the market in Europe from 2015 up until like the late 2017 timeframe, the equity market went bananas over there. So with the U.S. in a tightening position and the ECB kind of demonstrating that they might be loosening or or at least loosening heavily relative to the U.S., is the uh, European equity market a, a good place to be? You have to be selective. So the short answer is yes, with the ECB definitely not tightening anytime soon and still de facto easing, maybe extending uh, uh, long-term asset purchases longer than expected. Japan's easing like crazy. And there are people say, well, you know, your, your rates are below zero. You have negative rates. How can easing uh, give you any more relief? And the answer is cheapens the currency. So that's how Japan's getting it. Because Chinese are easing like crazy. By the way, everything I've said about the Fed, take all those other central banks times two. They've printed more money, uh, more uh, central bank leverage sheet balance, uh, more ease. So China's easing, Japan's easing, Europe is easing or delaying, tightening, same thing in effect, all very aggressively. And it, in theory, it's good for European exporters. So it's good for heavy equipment manufacturers, arms manufacturers. It's good for tourism. It's good for certain sectors. But then again, you know, with global supply chains, uh, you may be an exporter, but you're probably importing your components. So if you get a little more exports based on your cheap currency, remember, you got to pay more for your inputs. The other uh, thing that's going on is that because of the U.S.-China trade war and the impact that has on China, and a lot of the impact, by the way, is playing out in Japan, because Japan sells a lot of stuff to China. See, everyone looks at China as this export powerhouse. Well, yeah, in gross terms, but in net terms, you know, when, when China exports an iPhone, they're, sorry, they bought the glass from Japan, they bought the processor from South Korea, uh, they bought other components from Germany, and then they just assembled them. So the Chinese value added in iPhone is like 5%. The people making the money are uh, the Japanese, the Chinese, and the South Koreans. Well, if you put on tariffs and you slow down Chinese exports to the United States, the real people who suffer are Japan, South Korea, and Germany, because they have the high value added exports that go to China for the assembly process. By the way, guess who's in a recession? Japan, Germany, and we just saw the South Korea market implode because of the truncated uh, talks with North Korea. Again, it's it's... Complex, needless to say, you can almost never look at a country in isolation. You can talk about policy and policymakers, but if you don't connect the dots, say, well, how does what the U.S. is doing with China affect Germany or Japan or South Korea, the countries I mentioned? You have to take the thread all the way back to see the impact of this. But the big picture is the U.S. is deeply concerned that the entire world goes into recession. You you remember a little over two years ago, 2017, remember uh, Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF, talking about global synchronized growth and every every elite, you know, Davo, uh, IMF meetings, annual meetings, uh, G7, global synchronized growth at last. You know, we've been waiting for this for nine years. At last, it's about six months. Now we're getting global synchronized slowdowns or outright recessions in every country I mentioned, including the United States. By the way, just a quick footnote on the U.S. because we just saw the um, fourth quarter GDP numbers uh, come out the other day. 2018 was supposed to be the year of you know 4% growth, and the recession was over you know almost 10 years ago. That's not the point, but we were stuck in this depression, a depressed growth all the way along. Well, second quarter of 2018, GDP growth annualized year over year was 4.2%. And everyone's happy days are here again. You know, third quarter was 3.4%, still strong, but down significantly. Fourth quarter is 2.6%. Not horrible, but look at that trend, 4.2, 3.4, 2.6. What does that sound like? Sounds like we're going right back to the 2.24 nine-year average. In other words, we had a little pop. I hate to use cliches. You hear sugar high a lot. But yeah, that second quarter number, that was a direct consequence of the tax cut. Trillions of dollars coming back to the United States. It was always here. It was here all along, by the way. It was just invested in treasury bills. Now they can, they're can. they free to do stock buybacks. And you know, a lot of companies, they wouldn't give you a raise, but they gave you a $1,000 bonus or whatever. Yeah, so we got a pop didn't last long. Fourth quarter was weak. Looks like early read first quarter of 2019 will be even weaker. Car sales have fallen off a cliff. Retail sales are down. So first quarter might be, you know, 1.6, 1.9%. It's not the end of the world, but we are back in this trough that the Obama track record now, sorry, the the Trump track record over two years old looks like the Obama track record. During the the eight years of Obama, We had some 4% quarters. We had more than one. And we had a couple quarters over 4% back to back. 
But what happened is they very quickly went back to, you know, 1.5%. So when you averaged it out over the entire time, it came to, uh, as they say, 2.24%, which is this very weak growth. It looks like we had a couple of good quarters in the middle of 2018, and we're right back in the trough. No reason to believe that we've escaped it. And of course, are we getting a tax cut in 2019? No, we had it. So now the year-over-year -year comparisons start to suffer. People are paying higher taxes than they thought because of the state and local tax reduction. We don't have to tear that all apart and get into the uh, into the details. But the bottom line is it was a one-time pop. We got it. It's over. We're back in the trough. Nobody has a solution for this. Meanwhile, uh, so if you take, uh, say, 2.5% real growth and throw on 1.5% inflation, that gets you to 4% nominal growth. How much is the debt going up? 6%. Soon on its way to seven percent, eight percent. So we're we're just digging a deeper hole. Yeah, this was uh, the thing Jesse Felder was telling us. He's like, never have you been at the top of the cycle and seen these dynamics kind of playing out at how fast yeah. we're accumulating debt. We had uh, Howard Marks on the show, and he said something really interesting to Stig and I. He said, you know, I just and I forget how he phrased it, but he effectively said, I think that this cycle is going to be not as pronounced as ones we've seen in the past. And it's going to be like this big giant movement as far as the, the business cycle. Then I'm hearing an interview where Ray Dalio is talking about his opinions on the credit cycle. And he suggested that this is going to be kind of a longer drawn out process. And when you look at the coordination from a global perspective of all these central banks coordinating the, the management of how they're inflating all this fiat currency, Ask yourself, would you rather have a five-year expansion with 3.5% growth, followed by a six-month recession with negative 1% growth, and then another five-year expansion of 3.5%? That's scenario A. Scenario B is a 10-year expansion with 2.25% growth. The first example gives you higher total growth. And you quickly get back to trend. And by the way, that's the history of most recessions, well, actually all the recessions, other than the one in 2008, 2009, since the end of World War II. That, yeah, you do have recessions. You do have a business cycle. You know, from 1983 to 1986, during the Reagan administration, real growth was 16%. It, we were banging it out 5% a year real. So we had a 16% growth in, in three years. Yeah, and then, okay, 1989, a recession came along. It was fairly shallow. Then 10 years of growth under at the end of the Bush administration and, and eight years of Clinton. Then another fairly shallow recession in 2000. So these are normal business cycles and, and normal numbers. But what's important about all of them is you fall into recession, but you spring back with a lot of strength and you get back to trend. It's like a great runner who... Trips, gets up, but still a great runner and keeps going at, at a record pace. That's not what happened this time because the 2008 panic and recession was so bad, the worst since the Great Depression. It was so bad that they couldn't let it play itself out. I mean, playing itself out would have meant Citibank was nationalized, Goldman yeah. Sachs was nationalized, et cetera. That didn't happen. They truncated it. Well, the problem is there's a cost with central bank intervention to truncate. The cost is if you don't hit the bottom, you never get the bounce back. If you don't let the V go all the way down, and Bernanke wouldn't, you don't get back to trend. What happens is it's an L. You stop the bleeding, but you just go kind of sideways. And that's what we've done. What that means, getting back to uh, Dalio and, and Howard Marks, is that there's really no precedent for what we're experiencing right now. I would be very wary of that kind of forecasting. And I'm in the forecasting business. You have to be really careful here because there's no precedent for any of this. Now, the other important thing in terms of what, what Marx and Dahlia said, failed to separate the business cycle and a financial panic. You can have a business cycle recession without a panic. We had that in 89. You can have a panic without a business cycle recession. We had that in 1987, stock, October 19, 1987. Stock market falls 22% in one day. One day. If that happened today, it would be the equivalent of five thousand Dow points, not 500, 5,000 in one day. But there was no recession. Actually, there was no better time to buy than the day after because the market came back slowly. So, so you can have business cycle recessions with no panic. You can have panics with no business cycle recession. But every now and then they come together. It's uh, again, I hate cliches, but it is a perfect storm. It's like two hurricanes converging. And that's what we had in 2008, 2009. We had a recession a severe one, but we also had a panic. So when Dahlia says, oh, this is going to go on for a long time, he might be right about that. And then we're going to have this sharp break, but it's going to build. I would say you're really confusing the business cycle and the panic. Panic could happen tomorrow for any one of a hundred reasons. 
I use complexity theory. I use behavioral economics, behavioral psychology. I use Bayesian statistics, Bayes theorem. But what that tells you is that a panic can happen at any time for reasons that cannot be predicted. You can see them after the fact, but people ask me all the time, well, Jim, when's the next panic going to be? Or, uh, you know, when should I sell my stocks? That's, that's how they phrase it. When should I sell my stocks? As if, you know, I'm going to call them up at three o'clock in the afternoon the day before and say, well, sell them now because it's going to happen tomorrow. So look, I'm not going to know what happens. No one's going to know what happens. That's what a panic is. Comes out of nowhere, catches you by surprise. You get a predictable behavioral response sell everything. I remember I was in uh, Japan in uh, September of 2007 and the Japanese stock market was tanking. And my Japanese friend said, Jim, we don't get it. We understand you Americans have a mortgage problem, but why are our stocks tanking? I said, well, that's because the hedge funds are getting margin calls on their mortgage positions. They want to sell the mortgages. They can't. They've gone no bid. So they have to sell good stuff to get money to pay the margin. And good stuff is Japanese stocks. But the reason they went out of business was because people said, well, that, I know that guy's good for the money, so I'll call him. This is how contagion works. I said, the contagion has come to the Japanese stock market because people need money to meet margin calls on bad mortgages. And that's, that's just how it, it spreads around the world. So you can't, now, having said that you can't predict it with high precision in terms of timing, and you won't know what it is. That's the other thing. People say, well, I've got a whole long list of causes of the next panic. But I promise you it will be something that's not on your list or my list or anybody's list. Because if it's, if it's on our list, we've kind of thought about it. We're doing something about it. It's the things you don't foresee. So my question, I turn the question around. I say, don't ask me when it's going to happen or what's going to cause it. I will promise you it will happen. My question is, are you ready? What are you waiting for? In other words, if, if you agree it's going to happen and we won't be able to see it very far in advance, why aren't you prepared for it right now? You just have to separate the business cycle and the panic, they're two different things. I think this is a great opportunity to talk about your new book, Aftermath. When you talk about how the stock market has changed, even though your book is not out on the street yet, correct? That's correct. I'm very excited about it. It's coming out July 23rd. Aftermath, I have a whole chapter on passive versus active investing. Now, Jack Bogle just died recently, and he was the father of indexing. He said, look, you can't beat the market. Just buy an index fund, pay lower fees, buy and hold, sit back, you'll get rich. Well, there's a little something to that. The fees are lower. Buying and holding has been better. Most people panic. They buy high and sell low. That's a good way to lose money. So there's something to it. But the premise is two things were wrong about it. Number one, the premise was wrong. You can beat the market. Most managers don't. Most managers don't, but some do, and how they do it is interesting, and I explore that. But more to the point, passive investing and index investing is really a parasite on the body of capital committers. In other words, it's the people who actually make, you know, they buy when everyone else wants to sell, they sell when everyone else wants to buy. They stand up against the market. They're contrarians. They're, you know, they look for trend reversals. They commit capital and they win or lose. And as I say, they can't beat the market, but they're price makers. The passive investors are price takers. What happens? when passive investing is 70 or 80% of the market and it's on the way. All of a sudden, you don't have the capital committers. Everybody's a parasite. Nobody's a healthy body, you know, putting out the blood. And then now you have a panic. So, as I said, it could happen anytime. And all the passive guys are like, well, we got to sell because we're indexers. You know, we got to get out of this. It's all robots. And when I say robots, I mean real robots. And what I mean by that is an order matching system. So you want to buy something. I want to sell something. We want anonymity. We put our orders in and the computer matches their orders, and we're done. That's been around since the 90s. That's instant ad. That's a lot of other systems. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the computers actually make the decision. The computer decides to buy or the computer decides to sell based on a high R squared of some regression that between, you know, uh, Rain and Brussels and Ford Motor Company stock. And, you know, James Simon's great insight and Robert Mercer was, um, you know, the first thing you learn in statistics, your first week of class, they say, well, correlation does not mean causation. And they beat it into you and you got to separate it. Uh, correlation is high. R squared is 0.9, but it's not causation. And what Simon and Mercer said was, who cares? We don't care about causation. All we care about is correlation because if you can find it, you can trade it. It's like, you know, umbrellas don't cause rain. They're highly correlated, like 100%. But, but um, no, umbrellas don't cause rain. But they're like, who cares? If I see umbrellas, I know it's raining, you know, so buy the rain. You know, that was a, a revolution in and of itself. And of course, they've made, you know, tens of billions of dollars. But um, that's the world we're living in. The robots are over 90% of the trading. 
they train them to uh, say train as if they're organic, which they're not, but uh, oh, they use artificial intelligence, big data, and they scan like every document in the world for keywords. And I can guarantee you the patient is programmed into every computer and they look for that in these Fed statements. But the problem is they're all, all the coding and all the algorithms on the word recognition software are done by the same like 28 year old, you know, engineers from uh, Caltech or Bangalore or wherever who know a lot more about coding than they do about markets. And they all write the code the same way. All the robots move in the same direction. They feed on each other at, you know, microsecond speeds. And at least so far, we've been able to survive the flash crashes. But one of these days, it's going to go down and it's going to keep going down because all the, one computer is going to race the other to the bottom. Investors are not ready for that. So I go through uh, two things. Number one, what are the clues staring us in the face that we're not paying enough attention to, we're not putting enough weight on that are going to sink the markets, cause a panic, but we, we could have stopped it, but we didn't. Awesome. Well, when it comes out, I'll be sure to tweet about it and remind our audience because uh, it is always a pleasure to sit down with one of your books and 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 read through it because you always have such insightful things to, to comment about and, and just really kind of spark a lot of thought. So. I just want to thank you personally for always making time to come on our show. I know Stig and I are just thrilled when we when we get a message back from Ali saying that you're uh, going to come on. So, Jim, thank you so much for uh, making time tonight to chat with us. Thanks for inviting me. All right, guys, that was all the press that I had for this week's episode of the Ambassadors Podcast. We see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thank you.